the format of this conversation is going to be, of course, we'll do a couple of intros around the table and then um, just have a conversation about skills based hiring and talent acquisition. Um, hopefully, uh, surface some challenges that folks in the audience are probably facing um, and maybe some actionable takeaways for how folks can get this kind of thing done at their organization. Um, and I know that we have two of the best experts in that on the line. So excited to get started. Um, so by way of introduction um, for folks on the line, I'm Rebecca Rombaum, Chief Business Development Officer at Flatiron School. Um, Flatiron is a transformative technical training school. We, uh, we empower individuals as well as corporations, governments, universities um, with technical training for the most in-demand skills in the job markets. Um, and we're here with Maurice Jones, CEO of 110.org. And I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Obed. Louis Saint. Louis Saint, um, SVP of Culture and Transformation at IBM. And I, I don't think I can do you two as, as much justice and introductions as you can probably do yourselves. Um, so would love to hear a little bit more about uh, who you are and what you do for the group. Obed, you want to start? Sure. Um, so Obed Lothain, as mentioned, um, I lead transformation and culture at the IBM company, which brings together um, things like all of our talent management, our transformation activities, try, driving cultural change and building skills um, for, for today and, and, and for tomorrow. So um, excited to be on this journey on, on skills first. Um, we've been on this journey for about five years now. Um, and and excited for the next chapter, um, particularly in partnership with with great friends like uh, Maurice. So Maurice, over to you. Thanks, Obed, Rebecca. Thanks for having us. And I'm Maurice uh, with 110. And 110 is a coalition now of about 60 companies who've come together to realize the North Star of hiring, advancing, and promoting a million Black talent who don't yet have four-year degrees into family sustaining careers and jobs over the next 10 years. And at the heart of our work is uh, skills first uh, hiring and promoting. And um, like Obed, I'm delighted to be working with, with him and, and others uh, who are real leaders uh, in this journey and who've already made significant uh, and substantial progress uh, as we attempt to, uh, frankly, have this kind of impact at scale uh, across, uh, across the, uh, the corporate community with, uh, within the country. So delighted to be with you. Um, thanks to you both. So yeah, I'm just gonna try to facilitate a conversation obviously talk to each other as much as <laughs> um, as much as you want, not, uh, not just answering questions that I ask. So I, I think one interesting place to start might be, um, you know, you've both got kind of unique jobs um, and that IBM is focusing on skills-based talent, non-degree talent, new pathways into um, an organization like IBM where there's lots of family sustaining jobs and really, you know, kind of leading edge technology being worked on. Um, and then, that 110 is, is focused on, you know, surfacing this kind of talent, finding, helping companies find ways to path this talent um, into great jobs. Why are you both interested in this? Why does this matter to you? And maybe why does it matter broadly? I'm happy to start. Um, Jump in. So there's two, uh, I would say from, a, from an enterprise standpoint, right? Um, one of the reasons as to why this matters so much for us is and why we started this journey five years ago is because there was a shortage of talent um, in the marketplace. And we, we found it um, challenging to complete or to fulfill all of the roles that we had open. And it was a bit of a paradox, right? Um, and the fact that, you know, there is a, there is a fair amount of individuals who were not employed, but then there was still this shortage of talent. And we were looking at what, how do we break down the barrier 
um, to, to real jobs um, and to jobs that we were super important to us and that was going to help um, our business and our clients. And, uh, and as we started to work on creating pathways um, into these jobs, it helped us to appreciate that by creating these pathways, it actually made a much more inclusive workforce. Right. Um, it helped us. And, and I say inclusive versus diverse because, um, it, you know, there is a number of techniques that you can leverage in order to find individuals that look different from one another. Um, and this was a technique of having individuals, yes, that look, they did in the end look different from one another, but they came from such different walks of life and thought about problems differently. And then it pushed us um, to think differently about um, the way in which we went about solving problems when the teams came together. So um, one is stem from a sh skill shortage. And then as we um, as as time progressed, it helped us to appreciate that it helped to create a more inclusive workforce. Um, so that's looking at it from the enterprise perspective. And for me personally, um, I I think there is uh, I I get passionate in um, about. Um, driving a more inclusive economy and ensuring that um, more individuals can take advantage of um, the growth that we're seeing in, um, in our society that is led by technology um, and improving pathways to that wealth creation so it's not limited to a few privilege. Um, and when I say privilege, I'm not talking about any specific race. We all have a level of privilege um, and oftentimes it's um, individuals with better socioeconomic status, um, by breaking those pathways, it just make our societies, our communities um, um, better. Uh, and, and that gets me passionate and, um, and up in the morning. And I, I would <clears throat> add to that um, the following first, uh, you know, thanks to Obed and, and to IBM. Uh, if you look at the country, though, today, what, what you see is a number of data points that, um, that have a connection for me. First of all, you see an incredible wealth gap. Um, and that wealth gap um, really breaks down along race and place, in fact. Uh, if you look, um, I'll just pick a city for you. Take Boston, the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston did a study, now it's about five years old, that looked at the median net worth of white families in the greater Boston area versus uh, that of black families in the Boston area. They concluded that the median net worth of a white family in the Boston area um, was about $247,000. They concluded that the median net worth of a black family in the Boston area was $8, eight, no zeros, eight. Um, that wealth gap is seen in every metropolitan area in our country. Uh, and the breakdown of that wealth gap uh, along racial and, and place lines, race and place, no question about it, there's a connection. You look at the things that build wealth, um, home ownership, small business ownership, access to financial services, access to good quality, well-paying jobs and careers. And then you look at Another data point, which is this, if you look at jobs in the US that pay $60,000 and above, you find that on paper, 79% of them require a four-year degree. Look at jobs that pay $40,000 and above, and on paper, 71% of them require a four-year degree. Look at the workforce across the board, all cohorts, ages 25 and above, 
66% of us do not yet have a four-year degree. Black talent, 25 and above, 76% of us do not have a four-year degree. We have a credential that is literally a barrier to people earning their way into the middle class. So for me, this notion of moving from one where this credential is the gateway into family sustaining jobs and careers to one where skills are the primary currency to obtaining and securing a viable pathway to uh, the uh, middle class is frankly an American imperative. It is at the heart of whether we as a country can form a more perfect union and continue to be globally competitive on the economic front. So for me, this invitation to um, be much, much, much better at skills-based hiring and skills-based promotion goes to the heart of whether we will be able to maintain a healthy, growing, prosperous, inclusive, democratic experiment. Uh, so I think it's one of the great imperatives of us as a country today. That's what attracts me to the call uh, to, to go to work on this issue. That's not a small thing. Uh, <laughs> no, this matters. This matters. Yeah, and I think I'd love to get into kind of the tactical in, in a moment of sort of, you know, what skills-based hiring is. And I know IBM's had a lot of success over the past, you know, five or so years in um, moving roles to, to non-degree required and getting that talent in the door. But um, while we're sort of talking broad strokes, um, high level, important ideas, stuff, um, why, why is it not a college degree or why is it not only a college degree, which is I know what the job market has looked at for a long time as kind of a proxy for all of these skills that are supposed to be predictors for whether you succeed in a job. What have you seen or what do you know um, about about this talent, about the way skills are, are earned um, and what needs to be done in jobs that tells you it's not necessarily a four-year degree. Sure, um, why don't I, I start here. Um, it's, are there gonna be jobs <laughs> that require uh, a four-year degree? Yes, um, and for and beyond, right? Um, today, we sit at 50-50, right? 50% 50 of our jobs um, do require and 50% don't. So it is, a, it is a viable credential where it's appropriate. And I think one of the things that Maurice was underscoring is it's a barrier when it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, when it really matters is the skill. Um, so there is, there continues to be in and uh, 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 having this discussion with many universities, <laughs> there continue to be a very, very valid um, uh, 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 reason for why um, a, a degree in universities um, um, would uh, are healthy places to build skill and credential because you can build skill and credential there. It is just a matter of making sure that it's for those jobs where it it doesn't, it doesn't enable you. And there are different pathways, right? There are different ways in which we are educated, which we're trained, which we're enabled. Um, and whether it is, whether it's boot camps, whether it's apprenticeships, whether it's um, whether it's online, um, you know, very specific credentialed skills on um, data science or cybersecurity or um, uh, so it, it's exposing us in a different way and in some ways hands-on. And we all know we learn differently, right? Right? Um, and we skill differently and, and we have different and people um, from different walks of life have different experiences that then prepares them and enable them in a number in, in different ways where it became really clear to us was I would say about six or seven years ago when we were um, when we started um, re-implementing some coding challenges 
um, as part of our um, campus or university recruitment initiatives. And then we were seeing the high degrees of variability and the coding results from, from students. And what we were finding was, you know, you are getting some individuals who had like seven, eight years of experience in certain, um, in certain code because of what they were doing while they were in the seventh grade or eighth grade. Whereas there was other individuals who were not exposed to that. Um, and as a result, they have very different levels of result. And then it starts to say, well, it's not really what they were picking up in university that was giving them these skills, it's what they were practicing. And then so are we really put in, um, so is this requirement necessary for certain types of jobs? So it helped us, it opened our eyes and then um, around, you know, the results. And then what does real experience look like? Is that experience look different than what we historically thought it was? Yeah, just picking up on that. So, you know, I think the, the point that, um, the 110 coalition is making is we need multiple pathways for people to earn their way into the middle class. Um, and a, a four year degree um, where it's relevant uh, is a powerful pathway, uh, but it should not be the only pathway um, for you know, it's just a, it's a, it's an imprudent policy to talent development, to economic development, for there to be one pathway only that is acceptable uh, to, uh, to folks uh, getting into these kinds of uh, journeys or pathways that enable them to earn a living. Um, and the other piece of it is what uh, Obed was hitting on. So look, I have a BA in political science, right? The notion that on paper, because I have a BA, that I would be more qualified or that you would interview me at least for a job as a coder before you interviewed someone who did an eight week boot camp in code is crazy. That's probably the best description that I can put, right? It's, it's just, I mean, so part of this is just common sense, right? You come by skills through military experience, work experience, boot camps, associate degrees, certifications and licenses. Let's make sure we embrace all the pathways to the destination. And one pathway only is a self-defeating proposition. And so that's the point. It can't be only a college degree. Well yeah, said, I, Murray. So we don't worry. We won't interview for you for that. There's plenty of other things we could interview. For. <laughs> but not for that job. Right? Not for that job. Not for that job. <laughs> I like. Um, to, I like to try to fake that one, though. I like to try to fake it. Um, yeah, I rem I remember um, sort of shifting my career path from uh, being a writer, as I've ha I have an English degree, um, which was. A lot of fun and I learned a lot of things but I didn't learn how to do my current job um, with my English degree and I remember kind of shifting my career path very early in my career away from um, that writing kind of track and thinking how do I even think about this now um, that kind of I've, I've sort of been trained on this, this pathway but it turns out um, there's a lot of ways that you you learn and earn uh, the skills to do a job um, and it's not just what you do at your at your degree program I also say all the time that um, our graduates from Flatiron School uh, are junior engineers and senior humans oftentimes. And whether they have a degree or not, right, they've learned the skills to work effectively, collaborate, be on time, <laughs> um, communicate, oftentimes elsewhere, right, in other jobs, whether or not they have a degree. Um, and that makes hires much more valuable too. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, this can be a barrier for some jobs where it's not necessary to have gotten those skills in that setting um, requiring a degree. Let's talk a little bit about how to open um, the
to jobs internally, how to open the pathways, um, what kinds of jobs are a good fit for this? And, you know, Obed, you were talking about um, a coding challenge, which we often, you know, the industry often looks at as kind of the, the pinnacle of this is what needs to be done on the job. And so we're testing job skills. But I think what you were saying was we were actually finding that based on the way people were educated, they were performing very differently on that assessment, um, which might not have been a predictor of their actual job performance. Um, so can you talk about how to do a skills-based assessment? How do, how do we start thinking about skills-based hiring? Yeah, so it, 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 it was a good predictor, right? So, so, the, so the coding challenges were, but what it revealed was that it, where someone received the experience wasn't necessarily commensurate with you know, the time that they spent um, in education because they could have been experienced in practicing far beyond that, right? Because it was like, wait a second, this person been in school for four years, but they are performing as if they have eight years of experience, right? Yep. So it told you that they were getting a skill from someplace else far before they got there. So I think it is, it is who upon um, the organization to step back and then say, what are the real requirements requirements of, um, uh, of skill that is going to be necessary for these jobs. And historically, we have just, um, it's been the, lead, um, the lazy way out is just say, hey, you know, put a four year, four year degree, 10 years of experience and move on. Um, but we, but it's, it's more, it's more important for us to actually say, okay, here's what needs to be performed. Here are, um, you know, here are the requirements. So if you're, if you're a writer, then writing samples, right? Um, and having a degree in writing um, may be interesting, but may perhaps looking at and you know and looking at um, uh, samples and and experience and that would have come from many different walks of life is is more important and more indicative of what performance would actually look like, right? Or it may be long internships, right? So. Um, so by working um, side by side with somebody and seeing how they operate and think, that's why apprenticeships became so important as a training mechanism, but also a selection mechanism, right? So someone start as an, we give them some micro credentials and skill building at the beginning, um, they engage in the apprenticeship, then after, as they are performing, they're earning and learning, right? Um, then it becomes a longer selection cycle for us. Um, and it becomes clearer to the candidate of whether they really love to do this type of work, right? So it's creating um, new and different pathways that helps the individual, right, to earn and learn at the same time, and then also help the organization to make better selection decisions. You know, I, I um, <clears throat> so my view on this is, look, let's start from the proposition that every job could be done without a four-year degree and then add the degree requirements to the jobs that absolutely need them, right? So what we're seeing as we're working with this coalition of 60 companies is that you've got jobs in multiple categories. There, are, there are, I think the companies have already proffered 80 job categories that they believe one can come about the skills without a four-year degree requirement only. Uh, and those jobs range from sales jobs to IT jobs to finance jobs, to manufacturing jobs, to uh, human resources jobs. And so um, we even have a CEO of one of our coalition uh, companies who does not have a four-year degree. And by the way, if I'm remembering correctly, President Harry S. Truman, we should check me on this because I'm not sure I'm right, did not have a four-year degree. Um, so, you know, I think we need to push to the maximum here this, um, this, this notion, this presumption that you got a bunch of jobs that require that the only way to the skills is via a four-year degree pathway. I think we got to question that 
with respect to every job and answer the question. Yep. It doesn't make sense. Does it make sense for my doctor to have a medical degree? Oh yeah. I definitely think that's the case. <laughs> I was waiting to see what your answer to that was going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't get me wrong. Now. Uh, the, the point isn't let like, this isn't an anti-degree thing. It's let's start with the proposition that this is about skills and what are the jobs for which there's one pathway to those skills, right? And that pathway is the four-year degree. But, but we're seeing multiple job opportunities, uh, including CEO, where the um, pathways to that job include more than just via the four-year degree journey. You know, to underscore the point that Maurice, you're making, like, and so I know we're, we're kind of joking around the medical, um, the doctor, the medical doctor, right? But if you learned that your medical doctor um, received uh, their their uh, their degree uh, X number of years ago and have not gone to any training at all ever since, you'd be quite nervous, <laughs> right? Um, because the half-life of skills, it continues to shrink mm -hmm. and it's who upon all of us continue to reskill and upskill. But did they go back to university? No, there is different ways in which they continue to build their skills and to be educated. And that makes them qualified or exemplars in their particular profession. So you take that and then you extrapolate that to other, you, you could, for many different job professions, even the one that we would say, you know, right off the bat, you have to, right? Um, but to, for them to stay contemporary, they don't have to go back um, and get a new degree. They're just continuously upskilling and reskilling as the technology and the profession changes, um, you know, as the as um, as inventions are made, or as science is, um, or or new science and new remedies are discovered. And you were just fact checked. Um, so in the chat, Correct. um, so thanks, Jennifer, um, you have fact checked. You are actually correct, Maurice. Oh, now we can well, believe thank, your you, other Jennifer. thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> now, now you can believe my name is Maurice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just to, to push on this notion a little bit, cause again, I know we do have a, a lot of talent leaders on the line. How would you think about evaluating a CEO candidate without a degree. I think we've, we've had at least two C-level executives at Flatiron School who have not had four-year degrees. Um, I'm very curious about your take on something like that. Um, normally we would think that's table stakes, right? How do you think about evaluating um, someone for a high-level complex job like that? You know, I, I'll jump in to start with, look, it's about the experiences that they've had um, that precede their uh, assuming or being considered for that CEO role and, and the relevance of those experiences to the enterprise that we're talking about this person leading. So if it's a, if it's a newspaper, for example, if I've got a candidate who has had experience in the newsroom, who has been selling advertising, who knows what uh, the, um, the print manufacturing operation is like who can sell online and uh, who can sell in print, that person, and I'm sure there's some other things, that and who has led people, that person is prepared to be the publisher of that news and media enterprise. Uh, and I wouldn't hesitate on that irrespective of uh, of any uh, four-year degree, if you will. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a great question, Rebecca. You would start with like the way in which you would start with most jobs, right? So a board selection committee would step back and then say, well, what's important to the performance, um, you know, where the strategy of this particular organization is going and what do you need, right? So it would be their industry expertise, their industry eminence. It would be some of their technical skills, their performance, their um, how they've actually, you know, been able to grow other enterprises, et cetera, right? So you would lay out a series of criteria um, based on um, skill, based on skill, expertise, followership, et cetera. Uh, and I would be hard pressed to say, hey, the differentiator of selecting, you know, candidate A versus B is going to be, you know, the, the, the degree that they got 
30 years ago, <laughs> you know, or or 10 years ago. Um, so so it is um, so it it really does boil down to even the top seat is what have you done with um, you know what have you performed what have you driven and what could uh, and what promise could you make uh, could you fulfill for the enterprise that the seat that you're going to be sitting in. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, and, and when we think about inclusive hiring practices in general, right, regardless of what the credential is that you may or may not require, that's kind of a good overall inclusive hiring practice, right, is to benchmark what's important in the role against what that person has actually done before versus perhaps studied. Um, so I think we probably have an audience of people who are excited about or interested in um, you know, this idea of, of opening up opportunity for more jobs, um, for more kinds of talent that have learned in different ways. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to get an organization behind this kind of initiative? Um, I know, Obed, you, you've kind of experienced this inside a company. Maurice, you're probably doing this as, with dozens of companies at once. Um, how, do, how do you move the culture and the mindset? What might be in the way? How do you get it out of the way? Definitely gonna let Obed take the first crack at this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because um, as Maurice described earlier, like where we joined a cohort of 60 others. So while we've been on this path, um, it is actually really nice to do it with a cohort. So within the, um, within the context of 110, um, we have a breakout for, uh, or a squad that's focused on skills-based hiring, right? Um, and it's a collection of the companies within that says together, we've actually walked through like a six, six step program. Actually this, you know, this afternoon, Maurice and I are with them again, this, um, you know, on, uh, you know, very specifically on uh, so, uh, selection pa um, patterns. So we have in this cohort, we've gone through over the last six months, month by month, First was creating the business case, right, within your enterprise, and then saying why this matters and using some of the stats that Maurice in, indicated earlier around the huge exclusion of the talent, right? Um, secondly, was identifying a couple of key jobs, right? Where are the places that you're going to start? Um, what are the jobs that you're going to start? Then it's practically writing down the, the job description is looking at your job description and say, what did you ask for um, by way of requirement yesterday to what is it that you're doing today? The change management, how do you, you know, we have spent decades, you know, um, of convincing managers that this is the criteria. So what's the change management that it requires to get people to think differently and they get them to appreciate that you're not changing or watering down your standard, right? We're still talking about skill um, and expertise for the job, but you are shifting the mindset around how you look at that skill and expertise. What are then the selection tools or the sourcing tools rather? How do you go and find this talent? Traditionally, if all if your recruitment engine was set up, to go to universities, right? To go to campus. Like we we have a mindset in this country that in July you start preparing to go to campus. So if your whole recruitment system is wired that way, how do you rewire it to find these boot camps, to find, you know, to have partnerships with community colleges, to, you know, um, to create re-entry programs. So it is really then building out the sourcing engine. And then from a selection standpoint, is how do you actually change the mindset um, and the um, and, uh, and get our selection team thinking differently about the decisions that you're making? So we've been on this journey together. So I have, I've had the pleasure of uh, leading this chart uh, charter um, um, under the 110 experience for, um, and it's been a lot of fun and it's best and, and we're finding that it's beneficial to do it with a cohort where you can share experiences, share challenges, um, because we will face them, right? We will, we will face challenges as, as, we are, um, as we're pivoting from something that we're so um, used to doing. Like our fast thinking would take us to the way to, to degrees. Um, it, is, it is actually, we have to slow down our thinking and our pace so that we could then make 
um, different, more inclusive and better hiring decisions. I'm just gonna ask a follow-up question um, before Maurice jumps in. So what's the ROI of that, right? We hear this a lot, maybe that we have to slow down and then you know we'll have access to more talent or more inclusive pipelines. Um, I gotta think that IBM's thinking about ROI. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen it. Um, and actually, one, one of the things we've taken very seriously, is, there was a study more recently that was shown, um, and we've it's proven for us as well um, by BCG, which showed that um, more diverse and more inclusive um, management teams produce 19 points higher um, of revenue from new lines of business and then, um, or innovation revenue. And then what that means is, you know, new revenue from new products and services that was delivered in the last three years, right? So in order, we don't get to be 110 years old <laughs> without being able to continue to identify new streams of revenue. You know, while we did cheese graters a hundred years ago, <laughs> you know, we're in a very different business, uh, you know, with AI and hyper cloud solutions today and you need individuals from different walks of life to push you into what's next to push us into quantum um, and in the leapfrog into the um, into tomorrow's journey so that's where we see the ROI more inclusion um, and pretty much and uh, I'll go back to where I started is we had a harder time filling the jobs right um, because of the uh, the quantity of talent that was available for, for the jobs. Um, so we're, we're seeing it in the fulfillment of the roles and the building up of our expertise in our key critical areas. I would uh, only add a couple of things. One, uh, just to um, emphasize what uh, Obed was um, talking about there at the end, there's a business case to be made. Uh, and so we need to clearly make the business case. By the way, the business case also includes looking at the premium you're paying for a four-year degree um, or for a degree that may not be related uh, to uh, what you're hiring for. Um, the other piece that I would emphasize is just pure leadership, right? Um, you won't get organizational will uh, with any kind of um, speed unless you've got the CEO and the CHRO uh, and the leadership team really saying, look, this is something we need to be great at uh, for various reasons. And this is important to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to assess us on um, how well or not we do vis-a-vis -vis it. So like anything else, um, you, need the, uh, you need the leaders um, prioritizing this in order for organizational will to come together with any, um, with any efficiency. Um, so about 40 minutes after the hour. Uh, if folks want to ask questions in the chat or the Q&A feature, uh, feel very free. And if y'all are up for it, we'll take a few questions if people have them. Um, the first one from Nikita is how are organizations or your organizations or others um, helping job seekers prepare for skills-based interviews? I'll actually add something to this, which is I know that um, in the technical sphere, um, there's a lot of interview prep um, pre kind of a technical assessment, right? Helping people study for the interview. How are you helping people prepare for a skills-based interview? And also, how do you think about the need to prepare, how much to prepare, given you should have these skills already um, and, and kind of be assessing on stuff you've already learned? So um, I, I, I can start from an IBM perspective and Maurice if you want to chime in for other organizations. Um, oh, we've taken a lot of our um, education and put them on um, uh, an open platform for so, um, so anybody can take an experience. So just in the last year um, or year to date, 3 million individuals have been educated on our skills build platform, um, which is the external version of our platform that we use, your learning, um, 
which IBMers are heavy consumers of, right? So 3 million non-IBMers have been learning and building skills on, on our platform. Um, secondly, um, we have for our 26 uh, pathways or apprenticeships, we've created learning journeys, which are available externally, right? On our new collar um, jobs website, um, you can find apprenticeships and then create and build micro credentials. Some of them are our learning, and some of it it takes you to other learning platforms, which are free and available, right? Um, so, but it's about creating a journey so that it becomes clear of what are the micro credentials that you need in order then to qualify for the jobs. Um, and you know, when we and we've seen the benefit of that. So uh, I can tell. Uh, a personal story of an individual that um, was talking to me, um, a, a friend of mine who was interested in data science, but in, in the concept of it never had um, done it before. And I recommended her say, hey, check out our, uh, our site at the New Collar um, program um, or, or our New Collar Jobs. And, and so she went um, and she was very experienced in the retail industry, right? Um, but she went, she got micro-credentialed, um, applied for the job, and now she's an apprentice um, in, in data science, right? Um, and, and so it was a tough year in retail. Um, you know, the first year of COVID. And then so it was an opportunity for her to rebrand, redefine herself into uh, into something different. And she's loving it. She's loving it. Um, so I'm a big fan hit with the family now. <laughs> um, but but those are those are just some ways, right? So it is right on the, um, um, building those skills, uh, making it transparent of what's the skills that's need and then making um, the uh, the career or the learning journeys clear and transparent and accessible. Yeah, and I, I would add part of the 110 um, formula is uh, in addition to um, helping folks get equipped with the hard and the soft skills that prepare them to be successful uh, we're also looking for partners, both from the companies and from organizations like Flatiron and others to provide talent supports that include preparing folks, coaching folks for interviewing and competing for resume writing, et cetera, um, and compete to compete for these opportunities. So. Um, we're trying as a part of our menu to aggregate um, partners who can be helpful um, preparing folks with the actual hard skills and soft skills, but also um, helping to prepare people with those other supports, uh, the resume writing and the interviewing, child care transportation, coaching, mentoring, um, those are, uh, those supports are just as important, if not more so, to enable one to compete successfully for an opportunity and then to thrive within as the hard and soft skills. So we think you, you, you have to make sure that you've got, um, uh, resources accessible to talent in those spaces, just as you're trying to do the code bootcamp. Well, and a, and a follow up there, um, if we take this idea kind of to its logical conclusion of, you know, childcare shouldn't be a barrier to whether a candidate gets to go in the room and do an interview, but we know that it is. And so if I'm an organization thinking about trying to make my hiring practices more inclusive, thinking about degrees, I'm thinking about other things too. Um, have you seen any patterns in organizations that are um, executing really, uh, really good inclusive hiring practices that address some of those other things, um, like maybe internet access or childcare um, or those those kind of non degree pieces? Yeah, I think, and let me, uh, I don't know if you want to chime in at all on this over to start us with, but uh, I'm seeing a, uh, uh, organizations who are leaning in on, on multiple things like that to try to be helpful and more inclusive with respect to their talent. But let, let me pause and see if Obed wants to uh, answer that. 
I, I would the the only thing that I'd offer is um, we <laughs> through through the COVID experience, right? Um, a, a lot more which um, we thought couldn't be done virtually is happening virtually, right? Mm. Um, so so for for example, um, we onboarded now um, roughly between front in the COVID period about 80,000 professionals <laughs> virtually, right? Who, who have largely not been into an IBM office. So, um, or, uh, so they haven't through an interview um, or through onboarding, right? So it is, it is, so from a standpoint of, it is um, a democratized interview process or, uh, a, but if you, there is, there is a fine line, right? So if it's, if it's difficult for you to get childcare, um, for uh, for an interview will probably be difficult for you to get childcare for work. <laughs> so it is it's a matter of if you um, so there is there is some uh, there is some barriers that are beyond the, what an organization can uh, 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 can move to that you have to be available available for work. But we are creating and trying to be as accessible um, as possible for those who those who can avail themselves to the to the work. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. definitely seeing, uh, to Obed's point, we're, we're definitely seeing folks, particularly uh, since March of 2020, who are using technology much more uh, on both on interviewing folks and bringing them on and work schedules. And so much more is obviously uh, being done virtually than ever before. I don't think there's a return. I don't think there's a going back on that. Um, I think you've got an expectation on, on that. The other thing that I just wanted to add is, you know, I think the, the companies um, have really leaned into employee resource groups and forming them and these resource groups really helping to shape policies and practices that the companies are uh, employing to both bring talent in successfully and also to uh, retain and advance talent. And so I think the, the more and more use of these uh, resource groups that I'm seeing is really helping folks just get better at recognizing the totality of experiences that, uh, that companies uh, need to be um, uh, more schooled in, in order to recruit and attract um, talent. And then the last piece is just pure competition, right? You just, you got companies who are competing for talent uh, and they are, um, they are definitely doing things that they have not done before. And that is raising the bar for competitors. Yeah. So so it sounds like inviting employees into the conversation, inviting folks from multiple backgrounds and multiple experiences into the conversation about what do you need to be successful here? What do you need to be successful to get promoted? Um, and maybe that informs some of the talent acquisition um, strategy or tactics. Um, another question from Andrew, how do we train our hiring managers and recruiting staff to eliminate their own degree bias once we eliminate that barrier on paper? I think you're, you're on muted. mute. The first there. time that happened, the whole hour. It was, <laughs> it was bound to happen. It was bound to it happen. Was, I was, it was. I was hoping that it was going to be one of the two of you, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so one is to train managers to get off mute. That's one way. That's the first technique. <laughs> the, um, but seriously, to Andrew's question, um, we actually we created a. Um, a training program just across selection of, um, we started down a path of this many years ago of <clears throat> interview the IBM way. And then we pivoted um, about four years ago to select for IBM um, and start training managers. And so you, you got a license to hire, right? Um, so managers are licensed to hire and any interviewer, because we have a number of non-managers who are in the interview process and for an interviewer to have a license to interview. 
And then in the course of getting a license to hire a license and interview, you're educated on these things, is what are the common forms of um, selection bias, right? Um, and, you know, individuals who are similar to you, individual, you know, you over talk, so you loved what you heard in the interview because all you heard was yourself. <laughs> or, you know, you, uh, or the fact that the individual went to the same school as you, and then all of a sudden you think you have so much in common because we all went to the same school, right? Um, uh, and then so there is, it's training um, managers on the fundamentals of selection and then the focus on skill is at the heart of that or at the center of that. Um, so it was all things um, bias. And then look, where um, we are, anybody who tells you that you're going to eliminate bias in the hiring process is probably lying to you or delusional, right? Um, <laughs> our, we need to be thinking about how do we mitigate as best as we can, because as long as we still have people in these processes, um, you know, uh, we, we, we all have a lot of a, a level of bias. It's about understanding it, to manage it, and to mitigate it as best as possible. Yeah, hard for me to <clears throat> add to that. I think that's that's exactly right. It's how you mitigate uh, the bias. You know, I tell people all the time, um, uh, we, we keep searching for the perfect system, right? There is none. I... You, you just have to recognize where the opportunities for bias exist and attempt to uh, make folks aware of it and, and, uh, and to put in mitigants. And some mitigants work and some mitigants you will find will be less effective and you got to call an audible. Um, but I, you do see more and more uh, enterprises who are, um, you know, whether it's through establishing uh, inclusive panels to interview or blind applications, uh, you see folks um, really trying to get at this issue of the bias that we all have as flawed human beings. And, and that's, you know, I think that's probably the, the best you're going to see. We just got to keep at it. We just got to, we, we have to always know that the possibility for bias, as long as people are involved, is present. Um, thank you both. I, I'll add one very pragmatic tip from my experience at Flatiron School of our teams work really hard in partnership with companies to get our students in the door, help our students get in the door um, for interviews and pathways to jobs. And um, one of the things that we've found works is to just put someone that looks different on the hiring slate <laughs> get them in there, have a champion internally that's willing to interview them. And, you know, one time out of 10, that person will just shine and be a story that you can hold up as success um, and kind of percolate that, that success throughout the organization that, hey, this worked, can work again. Um, that's important. Uh, it's an important point, um, Rebecca, that I, I'll build on it and to say um, there is a um, the, I'll give the plus side and then the danger to um, the plus side is as you described it. And, and I think the caveat is, is ensuring that the individuals meet the, um, you know, the basic qualifications of the job, because what then, what can then happen, right, is individuals say, so told you, <laughs> individuals don't meet the criteria. Yep. And then it actually reinforces that particular, that particular mindset. The, the complementary piece to which of what you described around the hiring chant is ensuring that our panels, the people who, the interviewers are diverse in and of themselves as well, right? Um, because you, who has, who own the hiring tickets, right? Um, those individuals um, are, are diverse and come from different walks of life because they will help to provide a different perspective in the overall selection process. Um, and that's one of the things that's in our, um, uh, a gate, so to speak, is to say, you know, um, is your selection team diverse? Because we shouldn't be doing one-to-ones, right? That's where we see um, the greatest challenges, you know, one hiring manager hiring another, um, uh, one hiring manager hiring people who are in their walk of life, right? Or who looks and, and are experienced like them. I think you brought up another important point too, which is support within the organization, right? For folks with different experiences and backgrounds once they've onboarded. And so um, 
what are we doing to make sure that people are successful if they have a different background, which means they'll bring different experiences to certain parts of the job, which is probably a whole another hour, but we're, we're coming up on the end of time. Um, uh, maybe one quick thing to end on, if I'm an organization um, listening today and I, um, I, if I'm in an organization where I wanna get my team started, on skills-based hiring, I'm thinking about eliminating the degree requirement for jobs where it's not actually needed. What's the one step I can take? What's the first thing? You should join the 110 coalition. <laughs> Great. That's easy. <laughs> Be led by Obed, who's leading our skills-based uh, hiring work group. So 110.org, awesome. come on board. I learned it. Um, okay, that's a good one. Um, so if you want to learn more about joining 110, you can go to 110.org. <laughs> um, Obed, where should we uh, point folks if they want to read more about the great practices IBM has, has implemented? Um, so 110.org as well, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I would also say, um, I check us out on, so there's a number of um, materials that I, I've published personally, or you can go to um, our New Collar Jobs um, site very directly. So, um, so I've posted a couple of blogs on, um, on our good tech hiring, uh, on our good tech platform, as well as on LinkedIn. So you could just, um, in your favorite search engine, search my name, and then you can able to find a couple of things that just talk to um, our technique. Uh, but again, I, as I mentioned, uh, we, I, I wish we would have had a, a organization like 110 five or six years ago, uh, but we do now, we do now. So let, let's do this together. Um, and we'll actually follow up with the 110 link, the new color jobs link, a video of this webinar um, and some information about how you can learn um, how to get your your folks or yourself upskilled or reskilled at Flatiron School. Um, and I will wrap with one minute to spare because I'm sure everyone has a next meeting to get to. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who came to listen. Thanks for having us, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Thanks for what Flatiron is doing. We, lo we love that we are able to partner with you all. So thanks much. As do we. Thank all you. All right. Y'all have a good yeah, afternoon. Thanks, Obed. Thank you. See you later. All right. Bye. Stay well.